Hello and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we meet with leaders from the worlds of business, finance, investing and politics to understand what's really going on during this pandemic and how we can position ourselves best to survive and then hopefully thrive coming out the other end. My guest today arrived in this country in 1971 after being kind of part of that expulsion that was going on in Uganda under Idi Amin in the early 1970s. He funded his further education by flipping burgers in a wimpy bar and went on to have a successful career as an accountant and in business, culminating in, in taking the master franchise for Express by Holiday Inn Hotels. He also became an advisor to both the Thatcher and major governments on better engagement with the Indian community in Britain. And that led to a, a position as a minister in the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills then he was ennobled by David Cameron and became the first Gujarati representative of the Conservatives in the House of Lords. He recently published his autobiography, A British Subject, How to Get On in the Best Country in the World, which tells you something about why we've got that flag next <laughs> on his desk. He is Lord Dolar Hopper. Dolar, welcome to Money and Me. Thank you. Uh, t tell me a little bit, let me just rewind the clock a bit because uh, I think it's very relevant to, to understand the context of your own background. What were your kind of feelings and emotions when you were you know, forced, if you like, to come here back in 1971? How did it all seem to a 17 year old at that time? I think it was difficult. I came on my own, you come, coming to a new country, uh, not knowing what the future will be, not knowing whether you will get a job to, to survive. And uh, just having ten pounds was not enough to pay for for my weekly paying guest term, uh, you know, rent to my landlords. So it was uh, very worrying. But um, uh, luckily, I got the job. Literally, the next day I arrived here. Okay, and so so um, you you kind of started in that situation. And and did you did you? I guess I assume you were somewhat homesick and missed your family, but equally had all these new opportunities in this new country. It must have been quite a mix of feelings. Correct. Very worrying because I left my family in back in Uganda. Idi Amin had just taken over and that brutal dictator wasn't very nice to his own people but to British Indian community, sorry, to the Ugandan Indian community. And very worrying what, what will happen to them. And luckily within about four or five months they all arrived here uh, to, to UK. And, and over a period of time, they settled down very well. Well, it's interesting because I, I was um, in the sixth form at school at that time, and we had a couple of guys who joined us who, whose parents had gone through the same thing that you described. And what was really interesting was in just the two years that we were together in the sixth form at school, their, their parents had started building a whole new business empire in this country because, of course, I mean, they taken away everything they had but he couldn't take away what was in here. Correct. That was the magic ingredient. Yeah. I mean, as a history, there are 45,000 Indians in Uganda, and I mean, gave 90 days to leave. Of that, this country gave a very warm welcome to 28,000 within those 90 days. And a large number of charity organizations were at the airport, extensively receiving them. And there was a day I happened to be there as well, volunteering, helping them as well in translation of, um, you know, from Gujarati to English. Um, the, the, the balance of the people, 2,000 went to Sweden, 2,000 to Australia, 5,000 mainly the Smiley community went to Canada, America took 2,000 as well. So a large number of other countries took few of those residents. And all I can say today is Uganda's loss was Britain's gain. And you can see, you can see our, our home secretary, Priti Patel, whose parents were born in Uganda, who had um, a corner shop. We all started with corner shop, by the way. And you can see Rishi Sonak, another whose parents were born in Kenya. And same thing, an explosion took place in 1968 from Kenya, not in the manner that Idi Amin did, in a different way. So that great asset to this great country. No, absolutely. But I mean, uh, you know, we're very good in this country at talking ourselves down. Um, what was it, you, you came here with fresh eyes, and what was it about Britain, and what is it about Britain that, that you found so, so, so good that it's, it's helped you to be so successful when you came here? I think this country gives you that opportunity. 
to to excel in whatever field you are, whether you're a builder or a gardener. Uh, the push it gave us to study evening classes and work full time at the same time. Um, many went into accountancy fields so they can work and study at the same time. Many went to become lawyers and same thing again, work and study. It's a country of great opportunity. If you work hard, engage. But the key thing here, Graham, is integration. If you work hard and integrate, you can, you know, you can make it in this great country. Okay, and, and that, that, that brings me on to the role you played with you know, helping the government to, to, to better engage with the Indian community. What were the sort of challenges that you found and how were you able to help and advise the government to get a, a stronger relationship with the Indian community? Well, basically, the Indians who are living here uh, tend to support the Labour Party, whereas the values were hard work, education, enterprise, family. These were the values. It's educating them to listen. We are no different from you. Uh, we believe in, in hard work. We accept and respect British values. We enhance those British values. So we are very much no different from yourselves. So please, please accept us as to what we are and who we are. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of prejudice at the time from many organizations. Um, uh, and uh, by them coming to know us better, we coming to them better, we, we worked hard, we integrated. But the key thing was, as I said, two things, is English and integration. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Now, I think, obviously, in, in the time that's elapsed since then, India itself has changed a lot and is now becoming a real powerhouse economy with well-educated, quite young people. Uh, you could almost argue now it's got, you know, as much or more opportunity than, than, than we have here. So what do you think we need to do as we head, go forward for the, Britain's relationship with India to really blossom and for us to share in the growth that India's experienced? I think the advantage of India is like us. It's a free country, rule of law, democracy, all that. India needs huge amount of inward investment. India needs to sort of get better ease of doing business, they need to sort of motor down a number of legislation. I think the most important thing for India is to encourage their corporates to borrow money from abroad because our money is the one or two percent compared to theirs at nine or ten percent. That will help um, inward investment and foreign direct investment coming to India. The ability to borrow from UK and other countries will make a huge difference in the Indian economy. Okay. And, but we and have so, so much in common. We have good trade and uh, 1.3 billion customers. Economically, India is very important to us. Um, and currently, there are anti-Chinese sentiments. And India has an opportunity. But India should not take it for granted that they will get it. They've got to make it happen. Mm, yeah. And I guess it's quite a big culture change for them. Because if you look back, they, you know, we, we think we can be bureaucratic. But certainly, India was very bureaucratic. And... and you know, that they need to change to perhaps a more enterprise-driven culture. Okay. But the important thing is we have shared history, common knowledge of English language, rule of law, democracy. This, all this helps a lot for a huge country like India. And of course, they have a large number of young people employable and um, 400 million middle class as well. And highly educated, talented people that India has. And India needs a, a huge infrastructure investment. This is where we can help. India needs to borrow a lot of money. This is our, you know, London is a financial center of the world. Again, this is the area we can work with India. Yeah, indeed. And you, you touched on, uh, on India and China there. And obviously there's been some real tensions on the border. And we've also now got the situation going on in Hong Kong with the new Chinese security law. Now, you recently made quite an impassioned speech in the Lords about how we need to help the people of Hong Kong. And, I guess from your own background, you, you know, some of this resonates because you've kind of been there and done that. What, what do you think uh, you know, the people of Hong Kong are feeling at the moment and, and what should be done about it? Well, if we take example of Ugandan nations, they have been invaluable addition to Britain with entrepreneur skill, you know, knowing the language uh, have, uh, and Hong Kong people are very similar. They have this entrepreneur skill, knowing the language, they believe in rule of law, democracy, uh, enterprise is key, and we need we need those talented entrepreneurs post COVID nineteen to uh, rejuvenate our economy. So, so, so you'd be a great asset so, to a country. I'm sorry. They'll be a great asset to a country. 
Yeah, and, 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 and the motivation seems to be there when, when you have to, when you're kind of forced to change countries, the, the motivation to be successful in that new country seems much stronger than the indigenous population. Correct. Okay, so, so would you be in favor of us potentially offering UK citizenship to anyone displaced from Hong Kong who feels nervous yes, at these new laws? <clears throat> Yes, we will be. The government is, and I, I fully endorse that, actually, although it's unlikely that many Hong Kong Chinese will come here. They prefer countries like Australia, New Zealand. Canada is a country that's taken many Hong Kong Chinese, uh, especially in the areas, the west coast of Canada, in Renko and all that. So they may prefer other destinations, but to have a British passport is some sort of insurance policy for them. It's a comfort they've got that they wouldn't have living in, in Hong Kong. So what do you think the um, response internationally needs to be? Because it, it feels to me like, you know, China is really pushing now. You've got the, the Indian border, you've got the South China Seas, you've got Hong Kong. You know, they're, 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 they're on the way to becoming a bit of a pariah state. I mean, what, what specific kind of measures and sanctions do you think countries like Britain and America should be introducing to try and, you know, put some kind of control on China's ambition? I think the, the making of China, if you look at making of China, I mean, you've got to give them credit. You know, they're hard workers. They've got 400 million people out of, out of poverty. But who is making of China? Us. When I say us, means our country, Europe, United States. We buy the products. We are the biggest buyers uh, of Chinese goods and services. And you can't beat China when it comes to uh, price and quality as well. So I think what we can do really is find an alternative source of supply. And I would say India is a good source. We can, try, we can, we can buy from India. Let, let India make what Chinese are making and selling it to us here. But the other place, which is my special interest, is Africa. Another continent with 1.3 million people. Africa is all the natural resources you can think of. Again, very highly educated workforce. Um, then we need to help them to get their 400 million people out of poverty. Um, and if you use our international aid or international development money to train the skill that Africans need and set up manufacturing plants in Africa, we can, we can use an alternative supply of Africa stroke India. That's interesting. I, mean, I think certainly, I think the story and the case for India is a very strong one. Um, Africa seems to be one of these uh, uh, territories where there's always been lots of potential. I mean, we know there's lots of natural resources there, and China's certainly been taking its share of those. Um, but it never quite seems to fulfill, for, for perhaps reasons like, you know, their, their governance standards and their, their, their even things like property laws and so on. So what do you think, is, is there a particular nucleus of, of, in Africa, a particular group of countries that you think give us the best chance of actually making something happen there? Yes, in fact, um, let me give some, uh, when, when I meet a large number of British businesses here in UK, because I'm Prime Minister Straight Envoy for Uganda and Rwanda, but I cover other African countries as well, and I regularly engage with them. Our problem, the British company have a problem with Africa. The problem is that we see Africa with a band-aid lens. We think Africa is poor, they're coming to beg money, tribalism, dictatorship, corruption, all this we see Africa with uh, not, you know, positively, but they don't realize it's a new Africa we're dealing with. It's changing so fast, so quick. And um, there are no more dictators, for example. Corruption area, they admit it's a major problem they have and they're addressing as much as they can. The democracy is now working. You saw what happened in Malawi this week. You know, the court uh, rejected the outcome of the election and a new president has now come in. It happened in Kenya as well, Uhuru Kenyatta coming back as the president of Kenya. So Africa is changing so fast. In that change process, let's be part of them. Let's work with them. And they're very keen to work with us. They trust us more than any other country in the world. They like us. They look up on us. Half of those African countries were our colonies. And they're also part of Commonwealth as well. So we have a tremendous potential. Africa has got every national resource you can think of. Gas, oil, copper, zinc, you, you name it, they've got it. In fact, Africa has got such a fertile land that can produce food for the whole world in that uh, continent. So I think we need to help and support them. And that's an area that's huge potential we have. 
we have a new African minister, uh, Dudridge, who was born in South Africa, and he's obviously going to look into Africa as a continent where we can do more trade with Africa. Okay. So it's trade, not aid. That's important. Well, and exactly. Aid and aid money, we can use that to train them to make shirts and trousers and shoes and you name it, and help them to set up factories. Most African governments I've spoken to, if a manufacturer from the UK comes to Africa, they're willing to give free land so they can build a factory. The training money can, can come from our deficit budget, you know, and so we're helping development and we're helping Africa to get people out of poverty. Okay, well, I think that, that, that brings us into something that unfortunately is affecting Africa as well as the rest of the world, of course, which is COVID-19. Um, again, you're, in a recent speech, you described it as being far worse than, than, than a war. Perhaps so you could explain what, what, what you mean by that. What, in what ways do you see this as being worse than a war? Well, COVID-19, in fact, um, you, know, you know, we now live in a different world. Uh, the world will not be the same. UK will not be the same and should not be the same. And this is a crucial moment of change and renewal for us all. Um, we should see this as the best opportunity to change uh, our mindset. These exceptional crises require exceptional actions. And this is a good opportunity for us to look at not just short and midterm, term but long term, how we can transform our country uh, and our economy. Okay, uh, uh, that's true, but I think it's it's kind of very hard to forecast at this point what the full impact will be. And if you think back even just to 2008, which certainly didn't seem, uh, looking back to be as big a crisis as this one, it actually took until 2010-11 to really understand the full impact. And I think people are already talking about a V-shaped recovery as if this is all going to be gone by Christmas or something. <laughs> yeah, what do you see as the longer term effects and how long is it going to take us to really get back to where we were before this in an economic sense? Well, I think Rishi Sonak has done a good job in, in jump-starting our economic recovery and growth. And, um, and we must redesign ourselves to make the best use of opportunities available. But, um, and he's made a start with a consumer-led economy, which is a good thing he's done. That's a, a, a good start. But it's like, if I put it in medical terms, we have taken paracetamol, you know, to get rid of that pain, find the short term. In the long term, we need a ventilator, not paracetamol, you know. Uh, <clears throat> we must sort of, you know, give blood transfusion to this human body. In other words, we must print more money and make more money available in the economy. Um, to just not cure short term but medium and long term problems, you know. Um, I think we, you know, it's nice to have a consumer led economy, but we should look at areas that we do best and we do, we need that desperately. If you look at our export import, for example, trade balance, we have a 60 billion pound deficit annually for the last four decades. So that's going to jump up to about 200 billion shortly or in this year or next year. So in other words, we don't have enough exports to pay for our imports. And this is where we should come in. So we should encourage our manufacturing. You know, we can't even manufacture PPE in our country. Help manufacturing companies, give those tax incentives to more, man more manufacturing set up in the UK. I mean, 10% of our GDP's manufacturing it used to be 40% not long ago. So that's really gone down compared to Germans and French, and we need to support our manufacturing. But that 10% creates about 30% of export. So manufacturing is key. Half of our export is financial and professional services. This is another area we need to support. We need to sort of work on, on areas that generate income coming to us, not just spending. Spending is fine to restart. As I said, spending is fine as a paracetamol, but we need that ventilator to so take it to another level. And this is perhaps where we can take uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that we've had from COVID, which is the, the global supply chains that have broken down. Perhaps the answer is we need to reshore this manufacturing, even if it means higher prices? Yes, it's, it's, it's worth producing here if it means it's going to cost more than what Chinese sell it us. It's worth doing it. Right. People, I guess... will, be, people will be prepared to pay more 
or as much as 10, 15, 20 percent for UK made products and a Chinese made product. And also it would generate new jobs, which is another thing we're going to need desperately because you've had a lot of experience in the in the hospitality sector, which must have been one of the worst hit during the pandemic. Um, I mean, what, what are your kind of contacts in the hotel industry saying about, you know, losing 100 percent of their revenue overnight? I mean, it must just be uh, inconceivable for most uh, business owners to imagine that. Yes, the hospital is going going through the worst, in fact, and uh, most of hotels have been closed until recently. Many still haven't opened up. And um, obviously, the guy, the Rishi, has given some concession on the rates, and his announcement yesterday was, was good that um, the WIT will be dropping 20% to 5%. But what's the point if people are not going to occupy the rooms? So we need to open that. That is a key sector because tourism is our third largest export earner. How can we get back those tourists coming to this country? And about 2 million jobs working in that industry. We need to do something more than what Rishi has done yesterday. Well, I think the problem is, to be fair, that, that, that what he's, he's denounced kind of you know, financial measures. But the problem is now, I think, psychological in that because of all the onslaught from the government and the media, people are frightened of their own shadow and scared to go out you know so we we somehow need to restore people's confidence that they're not going to drop dead the second they go through their front door correct yeah in fact uh, so you know a large number of airports worldwide is closed so not why many tourists can come here and we need to obviously find a cure for this pandemic and and let's kick start the economy the world is very anxious very keen certain european countries are open their airports encouraging tourists uk tourists to come there which is good we saw spending, you know, we need to create wealth, and that's more important. Well, yes, and there's certainly been a lot of uh, a record, I think, level of saving during the pandemic because people have not been able to go out and spend any money. So there's certainly yeah. some pent up savings to be spent. But I think that, that I'm just wondering about some of the structural changes we might see coming out of this, you know, with people like working from home more, um, you know, people using Zoom calls rather than international travel. I mean, what, what, what do you think some of the big impacts are likely to be? I think working from home will become, you know, fashionable. People, in fact, I've been working from home uh, and on virtual with Parliament all the time, um, four days a week. This week is five days. We open today as well, um, and I'm enjoying it actually. Funny because I can have a break when I want, and two hours of travel time saved. So we get that two two hours extra in a day, which is something we never got. And Actually, people are enjoying working from home. It's, it's a good way of doing it. You know, it saves uh, travel time, cost, and you can get better output sometimes. You know, it depends on the company in question. You know, where that target is set, they will achieve it's a good work. Okay, now, now we, we, we've heard both from a, uh, certainly from a medical perspective, and I, I suspect perhaps from an economic perspective, that some communities have been hit worse than others. What's What's been the impact of COVID on the the engine community, where I know a lot of them tend to run SME-type businesses as well. I mean, what, what, what's the feedback you're getting from specifically the engine community about the impact? Well, with the engine community, in fact, they've been worse hit than the, the host community. You know, 50% more that, 50% more coronavirus uh, positive testing. So, but what's happened is in the age group of mainly over the age of 60, 65, probably I would say 70. I would say majority of them, uh, over the age of 70, that who died because of COVID-19. So um, obviously they're quite taken back and they're more cautious now. Uh, and um, this is a culture within the British Indian community of meeting and talking to each other and having a close-knit family and they've now stopped so visiting each other. They tend to be more, more cautious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course, the, the, the other thing that's uh, been taken off the agenda by all this is, is Brexit, and yet the, the clock is still ticking for the rest of this year. Yeah. Um, and it's starting to look like it'll be a kind of a no deal outcome unless there's some last minute um, um, miracle. What, what do you see the impact of Brexit being on, on, on UK business, and what should we be doing to, to try and prepare for it? Well, let's hope that we get this agreement signed before the year end. That's a deadline. Um, we are hoping it will happen. Um, it will have some impact in the, in the short term, but in the long, medium stroke, long term, we will. We will. We are. Our economy, our people are very resilient. You know, they'll overcome this. We've seen crises of this nation in the past, and we all come it so well. So, 
short-term pain but long-term gain. Okay, uh, and, and how, how would you like to see Brexit Britain? You, you, you've obviously sung the praises of Britain in your autobiography, but as, as you look ahead, let's say you know the rest of the 2020s in a in a Brexit Britain, what what kind of other changes would you like to see that would make it perhaps an even better country than the one you've experienced so far? Well, I think by having Brexit, <clears throat> uh, in fact, uh, although I was a Remainer, but um, I obviously became a moderate Brexiteer uh, when I became Minister for Business. I realized, um, you know, the, the difficulty we had in dealing with Brussels, the red tapes and bureaucracy. And um, there were so many business legislation going through Brussels that was never discussed or debated in our parliament. Some of them I never liked even, by the way, but we had to comply with the European regulations. And there were times um, this legislation came on minister's table for signature and civil servants would tell us, well, midnight is the deadline. So without reading 84 pages of the legislation, we had to sign it even occasionally. So, so I became a moderate Brexiteer. And now that we are, you know, um, you're going to leave Europe, you know, I'm more excited about it because we have huge opportunity outside the European Union. We can make our own legislation. We can water down a number of legislations that we had difficult in trading with many countries. For example, our UK export finance it would be a 10 year term under EU rules or OECD rules. Now we can do 15 stroke 20 years the way we can compete with China on international trade with Brexit. But um, you know, we have 54 countries, a family of 54 countries, Commonwealth, with basically one third of the world population, one third of the world customers, and the commonality we offer English language, judiciary, rule of law, and all that. We can do a lot more trade in those countries. Americans are our allies. Um, again, I used to say in my speeches that uh, uh, Europe is our trading partner, America is our ally, but Commonwealth is our family. So we'll be back to our family doing more business. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's a nice analogy, and I think uh, I'm not sure that enough is said about the, the positive sides of Brexit. It's, it's kind of become such a, a long slog, I guess, and, and lots of entrenched positions, but it really is a kind of a reset for the economy and for the, the society, isn't it? There's such right. a lot of potential for change there. Yes, yeah, time for change and renewal, COVID-19 and Brexit, two things together for this country, and we will, we will address it. We have a very intelligent uh, Chancellor. And, and a good cabinet, for instance, to, to look forward, to look long term and see how we can uh, change to, to, to our liking. Now, we're, we're right in the middle of this um, sort of Black Lives Matter movement, and, and that seems to have morphed into a, um, a very, being very strong on anything to do with racism and history and racism and statues being torn down and things. Uh, 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 where, where do you stand on this in terms of? You know, I mean, obviously you've had your own experience coming to this country. Did, did you experience racism? And, and, and what, what steps do you think, uh, further steps, need to be taken to try and address this? Well, I must admit I haven't looked much into it. And uh, obviously any prejudice against anyone is something that I don't like. In fact, I had a debate in Parliament on anti-Semitism, you know, um, although I am not Jew, but I spoke on the subject because today is Jewish, tomorrow it will be us. But going back on this movement and and the colonial history of uh, UK and other countries, I mean, if you look and talk to people in India or Africa, uh, it's a very positive history. It's not negative compared to what Germans and Portuguese and French did to their colonies. I mean, in India, they brought the English language, they brought uh, the railways, the cricket, the rule of law. And now we're able to interact so well because we know each other from our history. Um, so there are a lot of good things that has happened. It's not all negative. Yes, there were a few old things. On slave trade, we were, we were the ones who abolished slave trade. We were not for it. It was this country who was the forefront to remove slave trade. I think it's, it's a very dangerous sort of slippery slope when you try to apply 2020 thinking to things that happened three, four, five hundred years ago. Right, yeah. Don't look back, let's look forward and get on with it, you know. <laughs> we, live in very, we, we live in a very diverse country, we celebrate the diversity, you can see our cabinet is very diverse as well. 
you know, people from different parts of the world, from Guyana, from Uganda, from Kenya, from India, so forth. So most of them obviously British born as well. But the parents came from that, um, you know. Um, we are making good progress when it comes to diversity and all that. So uh, than many other countries in the world. Okay, and as we come to the end of our, of our time together, Dola, uh, uh, many of our viewers are, are business owners and investors. Um, obviously, you know, reeling a bit from everything that's gone on, trying to find what they should be doing now going forward. What, what would your advice be to them in terms of the, the, the way they should be positioning themselves to, to survive the, the, the pandemic and then be hopefully in a position to thrive coming out the other end of it? I think I've said that in my book, every recession brings an opportunity and they've got a great opportunity. I think cash is king. Um, do nothing for the time being. Make sure you run your business well. Look for new markets, new customers. Carry on. Wait for six months, 12 months, maybe. Good opportunities will come. And if you survive, you will do better. Out of every recession, people who survived have done very well. Okay, well, that's great advice to end on. Uh, Lord Dola, Papa, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.